over 20% of the microfibril uh, mass was lost. So if these fibrillin microfibrils that are rich in chromophores are susceptible to ultraviolet radiation, then can we use uh, amino acid composition as a way of predicting relative susceptibility of proteins to UV? So we took uh, publicly available um, amino acid sequences and we ranked 49 of the major dermal extracellular matrix components according to the UV chromophore content. And what we see here is that the fibrillins shown in red are particularly susceptible in these UV chromophores. But so too are many other elastic fiber associated proteins shown in orange. Crucially, the fibrillic collagens up here are almost devoid of these UV chromophores. And so what we did was to take fibronectin, an important adhesive glycoprotein, with a chromophore content of 13%, collagen 1, which has 2% UV chromophores, and we exposed them to ultraviolet radiation, this time up to 500 millijoules per square centimeter. What we see is that fibronectin, with an intermediate chromophore content, undergoes aggregation at these higher UV doses. Even at a dose of 500 millijoules per square centimeter, 10 times the dose that would be required to redden your skin, we see no effect on the electrophoretic mobility of this collagen one. Since publishing this work, we now have additional data which demonstrates to us that the main pathway of this UV-induced degradation of fibrillin and fibronectin is via reactive oxygen species intermediates. And this is important because it means that if we can begin to predict the susceptibility of extracellular matrix proteins to reactive oxygen species, we can then start to gain some insight into some of the remodeling that will happen in non-UV exposed tissues, such as the aorta, such as the lungs. We can also expand our analysis now, and we can look at all 20,000 proteins in the human proteome. And we can ask the question, which of those proteins might be particularly susceptible to oxidation? Here we have tryptophan and tyrosine content on this axis, and we have cysteine and methionine is an oxidation-sensitive amino acid on this axis. I think you can see that most proteins have around 4 to 5 percent of either cysteine, methionine, or tryptophan and tyrosine. Importantly, here's elastin down here, and here's collagen. Sorry. So these major structural uh, proteins are largely devoid of oxidation-sensitive amino acids. And this contrasts to the microfibril proteins that we can see here. Here's fibrillin, here's LTBP, here's fibrillin-5. So we have a big spread in relative susceptibility to oxidation. This could be important biochemically. We know from the work of others that if you fragment fibrillin, and put the fibrillin peptides onto human dermal fibroblasts, the fibroblasts respond by making matrix metalloproteinases. We know from the work of um, Franco Ramirez and others that the remodeling in tissues such as the aorta, which is characteristic of Marfan syndrome, Marfan syndrome is due to mutations in fibrillin, we know that that's driven primarily by dysregulation of TGF beta signaling. Microfibrils act to sequester, to bind TGF beta in the tissue. If you alter microfibril structure, you may disrupt that binding. And so we proposed relatively recently in antioxidants and redox signaling that these proteins, fibrillin, may play a role in aging as both a victim and a villain. A victim of reactive oxygen species. Here we're showing skin, so perhaps produced by uh, UV, but could be endogenous in other tissues. And then a villain, because they're triggering downstream remodeling events, either uh, triggering, triggering cells to make proteases or uh, releasing TGF-beta and promoting fibrosis or other aberrant remodeling. If fibrosis, then this could be one of the pathways that causes tissue stiffening. If we want to understand tissue stiffening, we, not, we need to take just a very small detour into a little bit of the physics of biomaterials. And the reason I'm going to do this is because when you read the literature, what you'll come across again and again it, um, is the measurement of Young's modulus or elastic modulus. So if we take a material, here's a rod, and it's got a starting length, and then we apply a force to that rod, and we stretch it to a new length. We can then calculate the stress acting on that material. It could be a tendon, it could be a piece of wood, 
We can do that by dividing the force acting on the material by the cross-sectional area. We can calculate the strain if we know the original length of the material and the new length, and this ratio of stress over strain gives us the Young's modulus. The higher Young's modulus, the stiffer the material. So wood has a Young's modulus of 11,000 megapascals, rubber has a modulus of only 10 megapascals. We can make measurements for extracellular matrix proteins. The top two were made by groups other than ourselves. And this suggests that collagen is a relatively stiff material. Um, Young's modulus of 1,200 megapascals. Elastin, in contrast, is highly compliant. Our measurements on fibrillin microfibrils suggest that they fall somewhere in between those two. But it's also important to consider the length scale that you make your measurements at. In general, tissues and organs are highly compliant. Highly compliant compared to the molecules from which they're made. So for us, it's very important to make measurements at the intermediate length scale, the micrometer length scale, because this is the scale at which the cells will operate. This is the scale at which most tissue structures um, are structured. And that's perhaps driven home by this schematic, which just details some of the plethora of structural remodeling events that we get in the aging aorta. So not an atherosclerotic aorta here, but arteriosclerosis, diffuse stiffening many different remodeling events at many different length scales. If we wish to understand which of these remodeling events is driving the stiffening that we see, then there's a number of strategies. One would be to extract individual components. You could extract cells, but in the act of doing so, and then measuring their mechanical properties, you may well change the phenotype of the cell. You could try to extract the matrix components. This is pretty difficult because, in general, matrix components are highly insoluble, highly cross-linked. Here are five common methods for extracting elastin. The simplest method here on the left-hand side uses sodium hydroxide at 95 degrees centigrade for 45 minutes. It also uses acetone. It's highly likely that you will change the mechanical properties of the protein that you're extracting. So another approach is to measure the mechanical properties in situ. There's a number of different ways to do this. We can use scanning acoustic microscopy. We can use atomic force microscopy. I'll concentrate on the former technique in this talk. We published in Mechanisms of Aging Development a few years ago on localized micromechanical stiffening in the aging aorta, in the aging sheep aorta. So the first thing we needed to do was to demonstrate that the old sheep had an aorta that was stiffer than the young sheep. And indeed that was the case in the, in the interlamellar regions, the elastic lamellae in red and the interlamellar regions in green. And we can show that the stiffening that characterizes the aging sheep aorta is localized primarily to the interlamellar regions rather than the elastic lamellae themselves. We can combine this with conventional histology and show that we see an increase in the collagen to elastin ratio, which means that in our schematic here, we can localize the stiffening within the blood vessel. But crucially, only within the media layer. What's missing is the adventitia. And one of the reasons this is missing is because of the difficulties of sectioning. What we see often is that whether it be a cryosection or a paraffin section, the aorta becomes disrupted. Here it's torn away from the medial layer. One way of approaching this would be to use micro CT imaging. This is commonly used for calcified tissues. What we've succeeded in doing is demonstrating that we can use micro CT imaging of an intact vessel. This is a rat common carotid. And I hope you can see that the vessel is highly intact here. If we look more closely, we can see the elastic, media, uh, elastic lamellae in the media. We can see the adventitial layer. But this is a single slice out of hundreds of slices. If we wish to exploit uh, the three-dimensional volume, we need to segment out the two layers. And we've developed new image analysis approaches to do this. It allows us to segment out the contribution of each of the media and adventitial layers separately. What's important is that this is an unpressurized vessel, and that state will only happen when the animal is dead. We need to go back to 1964 to look at the first studies on the effect of pressure on uh, vessels. Surprisingly, this has been followed by very few studies since. Walensky and Glagov uh, pressurized the rabbit aorta. They demonstrated an increase in lumen diameter, a decrease in the waviness, the tortuous, tortuosity of the elastic lamellae, and a decrease in medial layer thickness. We can show this in three dimensions now. We can show the 
very straight, elastic lamellae here, but crucially, we can preserve the adventitia and measure differences between the two layers. We can also look at the topography of the intimal and adventitial surfaces. Very early stages, still carrying out the analysis, but here's two slices taken from uh, a three-month and a 12-month-old aorta. I hope you can see that we've got considerable hypertrophy here in the 12-month compared to the three-month. And so the last couple of slides, there is hope for remodeling of the elastic fibers. This is data from skin, uh, carried out by my colleagues, Professor uh, Chris Griffiths and Rachel Watson, using retinoic acid and a commercial anti-aging product they were able to restore the fibrillin microfibrils at dermal epidermal junction of photo age skin. Whilst Habashi and colleagues who published in Science, we had the reference earlier, they were able to show that in a mouse model of Marfan syndrome, here's the disrupted elastic lamellae, if you treat with an anti-TGFB to antibody, you can prevent and partially restore vessel structure. The same if you treat with Losartan, which is a TGFB to antagonist. So all that remains is for me to thank the, the many, many people who've inputted into this work and the great generosity of uh, our funders. Thank you.